Mutations. Change to the gene of your DNA. First, before we get into how they happen, you need to know that there's many different kinds of mutations, so get ready to write it now. First things first, I want to remind me what a gene is. Polypeptide. Yeah, the instructions to make polypeptide, remember, several polypeptides can come together and make a protein. Some of the proteins are really small, so it would just be the one polypeptide, whatever. Your gene, that's a segment of DNA that contains the instructions for this is how you make that polypeptide. It codes for the polypeptide. Polypeptide is a chunk of amino acids connected with peptide bonds. That's why they call it a polypeptide, because how many peptide bonds do you think it would have in it? Yeah, many. Because the polypeptides, when they combine with each other, or sometimes just on their own, they fold to a very specific shape. We talked about there's different levels of structure, right? right? Way back when we did organic molecules. Primary structure is just a sequence of amino acids. Secondary structure is folding with hydrogen bonds. Tertiary structure is more folding from like weird polar, nonpolar interactions. And quaternary structure is piling different polypeptides together. Protein, that's a complex organic molecule that controls uh, your traits. Those proteins are coded for in the genes. It says make the brown one, not the blue one, or the green one, or the whatever one. Make the brown one. And I got those genes from my parents. That's for next unit though. Any mutation, like we just said, any change to the DNA. This says it may not be in a gene loci. That is uh, actually not right. So it must be at a gene loci, otherwise they don't really consider it to be a mutation. It's just a normal change to your DNA that we don't call mutation because why not? Loci, by the way, or locus, that's the location of a gene on the chromosome. We've mapped out the entire human genome. We know where all the genes are on all the chromosomes. We know exactly where the gene is to make my brown eyes brown. Change your DNA. Someone tell me why that would matter. Because the genes are the instructions. And it's not just going to change the one protein the one time. It's going to change all the proteins made from the point of that change on. Think of like a recipe book. You use that to make food. Yes or yes. If someone goes in and edits the recipe book, every time you make that food from thenceforth, it will be different. It might not taste as good. It might not taste as good. Or maybe it tastes better. Maybe it was an improvement. So the sense analogy, here's a good example of what a mutation can do. Someone please tell me uh, what the sentence says. This sentence says, says T has u ash ato up heo adem and adem agda f ish af. This one says, F isu wa sho tboot hol dme nidi nado te kri sha t. This one says the sun was hot, but the old man did not get his hat. This would be, you know, probably the normal version of the gene. These two would be mutations. Notice how everything Every is three letter. letters. Yeah, oh, yeah, like the codon. That's great. That's awesome. That mutation right there is what's called a frame shift mutation. It shifted the reading frame. We talked about how you find that start codon that sets your reading frame. Those mutations, those are two examples of a frame shift mutation. You saw how, you know... Yeah. Stuff got weird, yeah. right? If that's what you want, what the crap is that? That's where there's been a shift, frame shift, right? Usually the result of this are truncated proteins. A lot of times when you have a frame shift, you'll get a premature stop that comes along, or you'll just get a weird protein that doesn't fold up right. Here's an actual example from real DNA. You've got your DNA strand. After transcription translation, that would go down to these series of amino acids. You'll notice. It's the same DNA strand, but here they've just shifted the reading frame over one nucleotide. You guys see that? It shifted one nucleotide. Gives you a completely different strand of amino acids, making a completely different protein. I'm not saying it's good, not saying it's bad, but we can all agree that it's different. Types of mutations. There's many different types of mutations, uh, and they're named after sort of what they do to the resolving protein. So there are missense mutations. And that's where codon has been altered, so we're using different amino acids. These are named after the result. Missense mutation gives you different amino acids being used. So missense, different amino acids, that's obviously going to result in a different protein. Here's a good example. See right here, if that A is changed to a T, now we're instead of glutamic acid, they're using, that's probably supposed to be valine. That looks kind of like a Y, but I think it's a V. Valine. Think like origami. If on fold number five of your crane, you do a different fold, your crane's going to be different than it normally would be, yes? Yeah. Maybe it's better, maybe it's worse, either way, it's different. Here's another type of mutation. What if we change, you know, this 
What if all of a sudden, instead of being, uh, whatever GLN is, it's a stop. Now it's a stop. So when you get a premature stop, that's called a nonsense mute. Nonsense, no sense, no, stop means no, no means no. If you stop, you're not doing any more amino acids. There's no more amino acids, so that's nonsense. Different from missense. Missense is different amino acid. Nonsense is no amino acids. So whatever was supposed to be there changed to a stop. Translation will end early. This usually ends up with little tiny aggregated misfolded proteins. There's also silent mutations. These are the nice ones. Anybody want to take a guess what these do? This is where the nucleotide is going to change, but the amino acid sequence remains the same. Some of these are built in. Your cells is built in a little bit with the wobble effect. The nucleotide will change, but the amino acid will stay the same. I mean, you guys notice there's only 20 amino acids. There's way more than 20 combinations. Combination changes, still the same amino acid. It happens a lot with ones like leucine, where there's like many, many different ways to code for it. For example, if you change TCT to TC anything else, you're always going to have the same amino acid. There's also uh, ways of classifying this, so that's classifying the mutation based on what the effect is to the polypeptide. They can also be classified by what is happening in the DNA strand. So there's a substitution mutation, also known as a point mutation. That's where one amino acid is changed, or sorry, one nitrogen base is changed to another nitrogen base. For example, the A turns to a G. These are the ones that I built in to the homework to make sure that you were actually doing transcription, not just copying the bottom strand, the complementary strand. Great example here, sickle cell anemia is a disease that comes from a point. If you have the fat cat ate the wee rat, and then all of a sudden you change cat to hat, it completely changes the meaning of the sentence with just changing one letter. That's a substitution. Insertion, these are extra fun. This is where extra stuff gets put in. Sometimes it's one base, sometimes it's many base, sometimes it's all the base that belong to us. Good example is what's called fragile X syndrome. Fat cat ate the wee rat and then uh, stuff some stuff in there. Duplication, that's where uh, it's sort of like an insertion, but stuff's just getting doubled up. Often these come from meiosis. It can happen if the chromosomes are misaligned, and then if they cross over, now you're getting a whole addition part of the chromosome put on there that doesn't belong there. So the fat cat ate the wee rat, and then it ate it again. Genetically high blood pressure, they found links to there being some duplications with this condition. All right, deletions are often lumped in with insertions. They call them indels, insertions or deletions, indels. This is a generic term for both of them. This is where a section of the DNA is deleted. The fat cat <laughs> ate the wee rat, and now the fat yeah, yeah. ate the wee rat. Here's the tricky part before we get to the causes. Any of these mutations that we just talked about, indels, frame shifts, those could be missense, nonsense, or silent mutations. One's talking about the effect in the amino acid, one's talking about the change to the nucleotide. So basically, if I ask you what type of mutation this is, you may have to tell me two things. It's an indel, that's a nonsense mutation. Causes, we talked about this one a lot, the cell machinery makes a mistake. It happens. There's proofreading stuff in there to catch it. But think about it this way. If the proofreading stuff was perfect, so there's a fair amount of sloppiness built in, right, because We've talked about this a few times. Genetic variation is what enables a species to survive better in a myriad of different environmental conditions. If the environment were to change, if every single organism was the same, none of them would survive very well, would they? No. Right? So you need to have genetic variation. We talked in meiosis, how that's built into the process. But it's also built in to S phase. It's, we have a little bit of sloppiness built in just to keep adding more genetic variation as a species, just to keep changing things up. Mutations are the only way you're going to get new traits that have not existed before. So there needs to be some mutations. Mutations do occur naturally, and for the most part, as far as we can tell, they occur pretty randomly. However, there are also some that are not naturally occurring. These ones are called by chemicals, called mutagens. What's a mutagen, you may ask? I'll bet you can tell me. Those are chemicals, agents, anything that you could be exposed to that could cause a mutation. Radioactive stuff is a good example. Bacon has been found to be an example. Generally what they do, these mutagens are things that cause damage to your DNA, so they're breaking down the DNA strands. The lights over top of you all day, they're they've been known to cause mutations. They damage your DNA, cause it to break down, cause it to be changes to the base pairs. 
Luckily, we've got that proofreading. We talked about the proofreading. Literally, every day what's happening, the light or outside in the sun, which is even a stronger form of that radiation, light hits you, your DNA mutates, your body catches it, puts it back to normal. Light hits you, cells mutate, DNA proofreading materials catch it, sets it back to normal. Over and over and over and over. If it does. Unless you do something dumb, like expose yourself to really, really strong sources of that light, like all day, every day. Tanning by tanning. Like tanning beds. Then you're putting too many mutations into your body for your body to be able to catch. For example, a specific group of mutagens called carcinogens are mutations that we know, or sorry, are mutagens that we know cause specific mutations linked to cancer. One of them is light. So we talked about genes, we talked about like specific genes, we use like the brown eye example a lot. In addition to that, there's this extra grouping of genes that's called toolkit genes or Hox genes. These are regulatory genes that control the expression of many other genes. So, for example, here's your Hox gene. This one is controlling five other genes. If any of these genes were to mutate, obviously they'd be different. If this gene were to mutate, they'd all be different. these all end up being different. For example, if the conductor suddenly starts having arm spasms, everybody here is going to be like, we're supposed to follow the conductor. Get weird, I guess. If these genes are the genes in the pathway that lead to skin color, which they would be if there were like several hundred more of them. If this changes, your entire palette will change. Once we discovered Hox genes, geneticists did what geneticists do, which is start screwing around with them. Here's a fruit fly, right? Like the fruit fly from the meiosis square dance. Yeah. Yeah. This is the fruit fly that grows legs out of its eyeballs. We did that by taking the gene that controls leg growth, <laughs> sticking it in the middle of the mess that makes the eyeballs. So this is something, this is just changing one gene, but it affects the expression of many other genes. Yep. And uh, here's a good example. Here's, here's your normal. This is what's called wild type. When you have a normal, what you'd see in the wild. This is the wild type fruit fly. This is one with a mutation where now it's got four wings. Let's talk about, real quick, let's talk about this paper. This paper and this one that goes with it. The paper and the one that goes with it. Rock pocket mouse. Yeah, it deals with this creature called the rock pocket mouse. You're going to need for homework tonight, you're going to read all this and you're going to answer the eight pre-lab questions. We'll do the procedure tomorrow. It's a paper lab, but it's, it's, it's fun. However, talking about the rock pocket mouse, they live in the southwest United States. This is a rock pocket mouse. This is the same rock pocket mouse in somebody's hand. They're adorable. They're tiny. They're fun size. In fact, in fact they're kind of considered the Snickers bar of the southwest deserts. They're just scurrying around, and everybody eats them because they're delicious. However, so this is the wild type. There's a mutant form of the mouse that has dark. This has nice sandy color to match the sand of the desert. The mutant has really dark colored, not the moon. This is actually from basalt rock flows, from volcanoes. If you're in the sandy part of the desert, if you're the mutant, you're going to be real easy to spot, won't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. However, if you're hanging out in the basalt rock, there's the mutant. Here's the wild type, sticks out like a sore thumb. So they've sort of made these isolated pockets. Wait, wait, wait for it. So the question is, what you need to find out is what mutation led to this color being that color. Well, you'll find out. Read your pre-lab tomorrow. You're going to use this thing instead of the normal code on chart. You start here and you work your way out. First, second, third. That honestly looks so much easier. You'll see both or one on the test.